TV school time. The Iowa State Teacher College presents another program in the Iowa TV school time series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic is the manor. Your teacher is Herb Haig of Iowa State Teachers College. Hello, boys and girls. This is a cold one again today, isn't it? Almost too cold to take pictures. But whenever I visit a landmark in Iowa, I always like to take some pictures. Today, I took a picture with a filter on my lens. You know why I use that? Because if you put a filter over the lens, it darkens the sky. Now, you see this building back here is made out of stone, and it's a light gray. And in order to make that building stand out against the sky, you use a green or a yellow filter, and that darkens the sky, and makes a more attractive picture. You know what this building is? This is the church at Amana. Now, when you say Amana, it may be a little confusing unless you realize that there are seven villages, and only one of them has just the one name. The central village, where the offices of the Amana Society are located, is called just Amana. And all the other villages have an adjective in front of the word Amana, like East Amana, or Middle Amana, or West Amana. But this one is just Amana. Every one of these villages has a church. And the villages, with the exception of Amana, have red brick churches. But this one, in Amana, in the central village, is made of stone. And this is my favorite, because it has the old original stone in it. Stone quarried here near Amana a long time ago. And here it still stands as firm as the rock from which it was built. Now, Amana, that is the Amana colony, is a German community. <coughs> and has been for over a hundred years. Many times we think of Germans in the way that they are shown in cartoons, with big bushy mustaches that are used for straining beer, and we think of them as eating sauerkraut and knockwurst and things like that. <coughs> but Germans, particularly the Germans who live here in Amana, are good American citizens. And we mustn't make the mistake of thinking that Germans are a special kind of people and that you can always recognize a German when you see him because he has a big mustache and because he's carrying a beer stein. Now, I bought this beer stein in Amana because I think it's a very attractive cup, very attractive stein. And it happens that this particular stein has a, an old German song on it. <coughs> See the lettering on there? Oh, du schöne, oh, du schöne, oh, du schöne Schnitzelbank. Now, a Schnitzelbank is a whittling bench, as you see there at the top. And there are many other things here, and they're all labeled in German. This is a Kurzundlank. Here's a hin und her, a swing going back and forth. Here's a kreutz und quer, a sawhorse. And all of these things are parts of an old German song. But the reason I'm showing you this is that just because the Germans like to drink beer, and not just Germans like to drink beer either, as you may have noticed on television, but just because the Germans like to drink beer and have these beautiful steins out of which to drink it is no sign that all Germans are beer guzzlers. And you shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that if you go to a manor, you'll see everybody waving a sign and drinking beer. There are other ideas about the Germans which are equally false. Let me show you one of them. I'll put up my drawing board here. We must not make the mistake of thinking that just because people are of German origin, that they all look alike. Let me draw a question mark here. 
and we'll see if we can get some kind of an idea about Germans from that. What does a typical German look like? You suppose we can answer that question by looking at this question mark and developing it a little bit? Well, let me show you that cartoons do not always give you a true answer. Because I can make a cartoon of a German out of this, out of one kind of a German. And I'm sure that your father or your elder brother or your uncle or someone may have told you at some time <coughs> about a very mean and brutal German whose name was Adolf Hitler and who caused a lot of suffering throughout the world. And this was a German. Now, the people in Amana are not like Hitler. As a matter of fact, the people who settled Amana left Germany because they didn't like the kind of things that men like Hitler represented. A long time before Hitler was born, these people who settled Amana left Germany because they didn't like the Prussian army system. They didn't like this idea that everybody had to serve in the German army and that the German state was based upon this idea of warfare and of dominating other people in Europe because of this idea of fighting. They didn't like fighting. Now, of course, Hitler believed in conquering the world through war. He believed that the Germans were a super race. Well, the Germans who came to Amana didn't have any ideas like that. They were religious people. Religion was the most important thing in their lives. And because the old Germany that they left was warlike, they decided to come to America and get away from all that. So don't confuse the people in Amana with Germans like Hitler. It's a good thing we don't have many Germans like this. Because if we did, we would be in wars all the time. Well, I wanted to say this at the beginning so that when we talk about the Germans who live here in Amana, you won't be thinking about the kind of Germans that we see in cartoons so many times. Cartoons are fun to watch, but they are not always very faithful. Now, let's talk a little bit about how this Amana colony came to be established here in, <coughs> blow that chalk of Hitler off of there, how this Amana colony came to be established in Iowa. In the 17th and 18th centuries, there was a group of German mystics or pietists who didn't like the idea of serving in the army or of taking the oath of loyalty to the Prussian army system. And so, a little bit later on in the 19th century, a man named Christian Metz, a carpenter who lived in Ronneburg, Germany, had a vision. And in this vision, he was told to cross the ocean and take his people to the New World, to America. And in 1842, he came to this country with a small group and they found an old Indian reservation near Buffalo, New York. And they decided to buy it, 8,000 acres, an old Seneca Indian reservation. And in a few years, this became quite a settlement. Now, the idea that Christian Metz had was that the community should be founded upon religious ideas, that all who believed were gathered together and held everything in common. Now, this was what was called religious communism. This is not to be confused with the kind of communism we have in Russia today. This religious communism was founded upon the church. The church was the all-powerful body, and it controlled not only the 
the religion of the people, but also everything they did. And they owned everything together. There was no rich man, no poor man. Everyone had the same. And they all worked toward the same end. Well, they were happy here in this little community, which was called Ebenezer. But as more and more people came from Germany, the 8,000 acres proved to be too small. And they didn't like this idea of being so close to Buffalo because a big city had many temptations for the young people. And so Christian Metz sent some men out further west to look over the land. They went first to a place in Kansas, and they didn't like that so well. And they came back to Ebenezer and reported to Christian Metz. And Christian Metz said, well, look again. Look in Iowa. And so they went to Iowa, and they found a beautiful place here on the Iowa River. And they bought 18,000 acres here in 1854, 12 years after they had settled in Ebenezer. The land here in Ebenezer was sold. And in a few years, all the people had left Ebenezer and moved to this place in Iowa on the Iowa River. I can show you the location of the Amana colony a little better on this map of Iowa. Here is Amana. It's on the Iowa River, about 20 miles northwest of Iowa City. Here is Iowa City, which was at that time the capital of Iowa. Well, in a few years, this became a, a quite a thriving community. And this was chosen because there was good land for farming, there were materials for building, there was stone quarry nearby, native stone which could be quarried for buildings, there was clay which could be made into brick, and there was a great deal of timber which could be used for lumber. So all of these things proved very attractive, and it was not near a large city. And so Christian Metz said, this is an ideal place. We will draw a circle around ourselves here and keep the world out. And we will live our life of religious faith and devotion in this area. And he decided to call it a manna, a name which comes from the Song of Solomon. And it means bleib treu in the German words, or remain faithful. In other words, remain faithful to the ideals of our faith. Now, the Amana colony is not just one village. Sometimes we hear people refer to the Amana colonies as though there were several colonies. Well, the colony is the whole thing. That is, a, the combination of villages. The villages which are combined into one society. Here we are today. This is Amana. This is the central village. This is the place where the society offices are located. And then there are six other villages. And they take their names from the location that they have with reference to the central village. Here, for example, is East Amana, because it lies farthest to the east. Now, the people who live in the Amana colony don't say East Amana. They just say East. For example, someone in Amana may say, I think I'll drive over to East for a few minutes. And that means he's going to drive over to East Amana. Or he may say, I'm going to drive over to Middle, or I'm going to drive to West. And that means to people who know that they are going to Middle Amana or to West Amana and so on. So here is East, here is Amana, here is Middle, where the freezer factory is located. Here is High Amana, so-called because it's on the highest elevation of land in this whole colony. Here is West, because it lies farthest to the west. And here is South. Now, South is broken into two parts. There is Lower South, because it lies in a little valley here on Highway 6. This dark black line here is Highway 6. Goes to Iowa City in this direction. And Marengo is over this way. And then a mile further toward the south, there is Upper South, Upper South Amana. This is where the bakery is located. So when you hear a reference to Lower South, that means the, the main village where the church for South Amana is located and where the village is located. And there's a sandwich shop here right on the highway. And when you hear a reference to Upper South, that means 
the bakery. This is the only one of the villages that doesn't have the name, name Amana in it. This is Homestead. In 1861, the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad came from Iowa City to this point. And the people in Amana, who had drawn this circle around themselves in order to keep the world out, discovered that they couldn't completely keep the world out. And so they decided that the railroad would give them a chance to send their products from their mills and factories to the outside world. And you know what they did? They bought the whole town. They just bought this whole town of Homestead, railroad station and all. And this became the seventh village. This is Homestead. The name Homestead was given to it by the railroad company. And of course, we don't have the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad now. This is the Rock Island lines now. And this is a branch of the Milwaukee Road that goes on up to Cedar Rapids. So these are the seven villages. East Amana, Amana, Middle Amana, High Amana, West Amana, South Amana, consisting of Lower South and Upper South, and Homestead. That is the colony. Now, there are many books that tell you the story of Amana. This is the best one, in my judgment. This was written by Bertha M. Shambaugh. And it is called A Manna That Was and A Manna That Is. The reason for that title is that until 1932, the Amana colony maintained this religious communism. The elders were the governing body not only for the church, but also for the farm life, the factory life, everything that went on in the seven villages. And then people came into the Amana colony to see the customs of the people who lived there. You see, they, the families all lived in separate houses, but they didn't take their meals there. In each village, there was a community dining hall. And as many as 60 people would eat there. And the women all took turns preparing the food and washing the dishes and so on. And everyone ate there in these community dining halls because they owned everything in common. Those that believed were gathered together and held everything in common. The houses belonged to the society, but families lived in them separately, you see. But everything was a spirit of religious communism. Well, the tourists came in to see all this. The radio brought news of activities out in the world at large. The young people got a little restless. And so in 1932, it was decided, after much prayer and consideration, to give up communism and to adopt capitalism. And all the people who lived in the Amana colony were given shares of stock in the Amana society. And even though there is still this combination of activity all toward a common goal, the families now earn salaries, you see, and get dividends from their shares of stock. And the young people can go out into the world and, and develop careers of their own instead of just staying within this colony and following in their father's footsteps. Bill Zuber, for example, who has a restaurant at Homestead now, went off to become a pitcher for the New York Yankees and there were other people who followed careers of their own. In the old days, that would never have been done. They would have stayed right in the community and have been a part just of the life of the colony. So Imana that is refers to the capitalistic society, which is now the rule in Imana and has been since 1932. Now there are some very interesting magazines. Here is the Iowan for July 1954 the Amana issue. And if you write to the offices of the Iowan Magazine in Shenandoah, Iowa, you may still be able to get a copy of this. The Iowan Magazine. And this is filled with stories and pictures about Amana. The price is 35 cents. Here is the Palimpsest for June 1950, also completely devoted to the story of Amana. The Palimpsest, as you know, and as I have often told you, is the magazine of the State Historical Society in Iowa City, and you may still be able to get a copy of this for 25 cents. Then there is the story of Amana, which is published by the Amana Society itself. 
And you can get this by writing to the Amana Society in Amana, Iowa. And send 25 cents for this. Now let me show you a few pictures. This was the home of Christian Metz, the founder of Amana. And this is typical Amana architecture, built of brick or stone, close clipped eaves, no decoration on the outside. This porch was added many years later. Here is the trellis on the side. Most of these houses had trellises on them for grapes. And at the time Christian Metz lived there, this TV antenna wasn't on there. This is something that has come in since 1932. Here is a painting of John of uh, Amana made by John Noy, a famous Amana painter who is dead now. But there are many paintings by John Noy which are still to be seen on the walls of the restaurants in Amana. This is typical Amana architecture. Notice the stone. This is native stone. And here is the Amana freezer plant. You see and hear many commercials about Amana freezers on television. Now this factory is the only one in the Amana colony which is no longer owned by the Amana Society. This was sold in 1950 to outside interests. But the people of Amana still work here. This is the freezer factory at Middle Amana. And here is the winery. Here is where colony wine is made and sold on the commercial market. It looks just like an ordinary house there in Amana, but the wine press and so on are back here. And here is a typical farmstead. As you drive through the Amana villages, and there are about 25,000 acres in the Amana colony now, you'll be in impressed by the fact that there are no farm houses. All the people who work the farms live in these villages. And they go out to work the farms. And the barns and silos and machine sheds and so on are on the edge of the villages. Now farming is still the most important thing in Amana. Of these 25,000 acres, 19,500 are devoted to the cultivation of crops and to pasture. 5,000 acres are devoted to timber. And the timber, of course, is used for making the fine Amana furniture. Now, that doesn't leave much left in the uh, total of 25,000 acres, does it? 19,500 for farming, 5,000 for timber. How much is left? 500 acres. Right. Now, this must include the 160-acre lake, all the factory sites, the place for the villages, and the roads. So you see, mainly, this is farming community. They have about 5,000 cattle. The beef cattle is Hereford. The dairy cattle is Holstein. They have about 500 Holstein cows that have to be milked. And they have 8,000 hogs to provide raw materials for the meat market. And, of course, the, the farming is, is such an important thing that the products from Amana, that is the meat products and the bread, baked goods and so on, are so important that this becomes a very vital part of the whole operation. Now I'd like to have you see briefly some movies that I took several years ago when I visited Amana. And this will show you some of the other activities in the Amana villages. Mr. Bork has that film in Ames. So if you can hear me, Mr. Bork, and if you are ready, here we go. Here is the woolen mill. This is the oldest factory in the Amana colony. The people who settled Amana, that is the members of the community of true inspiration, operated a woolen mill in Germany as early as 1838. And so it was natural that they, brought the, they would bring their crafts to this country. This is the woolen mill, which is located in Amana, on a canal which is seven miles long, and which the founders of, of Amana 
dug by hand between the years 1865 and 69. And I see it powers this mill. Provides at least some of the power. The canal was dug between a bend in the Iowa River on the west to the Iowa River on the east. This again is the woolen mill. I took this in the summer, that's why the windows are open. They're all closed today. And if you look in the background, you can see the Amana cabinet shop, where the fine furniture made out of solid walnut and cherry is made. Here is the store, and the newer building coming into the picture there is the office of the Amana Society. There in the background is the home of Christian Metz. And as we go across the street here, we see the Ox Yoke Inn. There are three famous inns, eating establishments in Amana. The Run Aboard, the Ox Yoke Inn, and the Colony. Notice the stone there, 1858. If that were in the corner, that would be a cornerstone, wouldn't it? But it's in the gable instead, so it's a gable stone. This is a typical Amana store. And here we see the old and the new side by side. The old building erected in 1858, and here are the offices of the Amana Society, right next door. There's the main office. And here is that lake that I mentioned a moment ago. In July, this 160-acre lake, which is between Amana and Middle Amana, is covered with blooms yellow lotus lilies and this is a sight that is worth traveling many miles to see you can tell this is a movie because there are birds flying over it see? now if you look in the background there you can see the water tank of the freezer factory coming into the picture here in just a minute there it is that's the freezer factory in middle of this is a beautiful lake. And here is a cemetery. Every village has its cemetery. This is the one for Amana. Notice that all the stones are the same size. Showing that there is no difference. They're all considered to be alike in the eyes of God. There is only one stone that looks a little bit different than the others, and I'll show you that in just a minute. I have a close-up here coming up. Now, that is a typical stone. There's another. And the last stone here is the one that marks the final resting place of Christian Metz, and that is white. That is the only distinction. Now, I wish I could show you some of the products made here in Amana, but I got here too late this morning, and I didn't have time to gather them all together. So you'll have to visit Amana and see them for yourself. Next week, we are going to the scene of the Spirit Lake Massacre. So I hope you'll be with me then. Until next week, goodbye. Today, your teacher has been Herb Hake of Iowa State Teachers College. Land Iowa History is produced for Iowa TV School Time by WOY TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. TV School Time is presented daily Monday through Friday at 10.30 a.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television. Be sure to...